Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. We'll just give it a minute for people to come in. You're in the right place for Crisis and Hope, Activists Organizing for Rights in Guatemala and Honduras. Hi, as you're coming in, I just want to say thanks for joining us. You're in the right place for Crisis and Hope, Activists Organizing for Rights in Guatemala and Honduras. At any time, if you need technical assistance, please use the chat function on Zoom to connect with us and we will do our best to assist you. All right, and without further ado, let's get started. Um, thank you all for being here. Bienvenidos a todas y todos. It's my pleasure to be your moderator for today's panel. Um, please select English if you are an English speaker and Spanish if you need Spanish to English translation. Si necesita traducción al español, puede seleccionar su opción uh, haciendo clic en el icono del globo en la pantalla de Zoom. Kathy Ogle será nuestra traductora de hoy. We're thankful for Kathy for doing translation for us today. My name is Giovanna Oaxaca, and I am the Program Director for Migration Policy with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and ELCA Amparo. I want to recognize and thank the co-sponsors of today's panel, the Latin American Working Group, the Chicago Religious Leadership Network on Latin America, and the Mennonite Central Committee, as well as over all of our featured guests. I invite you to put your name and the name of your church or denomination and where you're joining us from in the chat. Before we begin, I also want to make a land acknowledgement. Though we may be joining from different regions, the native people, since time immemorial, before there were borders, have made deep connections to this land. In Washington, DC, that would be the Piscataway and Anacostan people. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout generations and also acknowledge our commitment, committed relationship to Indigenous peoples. Thank you. Here's what you can expect from this workshop. I am going to briefly introduce this topic and then we will dive into Guatemalan human rights context, followed by Honduras, and if time permits, the US's role. After this, we will begin question and answers. Please begin putting your burning questions in the chat. Guatemala is a country of approximately 17 million people, bordered to the west by the Pacific Ocean, Mexico to the north, and El Salvador to the south. The indigenous people of Ma the indigenous Maya people were the first inhabitants of Guatemala. Guatemala's peoples have experienced tremendous civil and political upheaval over the course of their history. From winning independence from under the colonial rule of the Spanish in 1821, to off and on military and civilian rule culminating in a 36-year guerrilla war set off by U.S. intervention in the mid-1900s. In 1996, the government signed a peace agreement formally ending that conflict. The war had left 200,000 dead, 40,000 disappeared, and over a million displaced. This year marks the 26-year anniversary of the signing of the Guatemalan Peace Accords. Despite a commitment to recognize indigenous rights, that spaces for civil society have gradually eroded, undermining rights and overriding popular collective movements to address social concerns. Brave activists, judges, and prosecutors confront a rapidly closing space to defend rights and the rule of law. They are being jailed, threatened, and forced into exile by corrupt actors in government, security forces, and the private sector. Its other neighbor to the South, Honduras, with 9 million people, also won independence from the Spanish in 1821, is living through a highly consequential moment in history after a dozen years in which corrupt and abusive governments committed grave abuses and restricted space for civil society to organize. A newly elected government under the Presidenta Chamara Castro aligned with social movements offers hope. 
President Castro's win at the ballot box is seen as progress towards creating a more transparent and accountable electoral system in a society with fragile democratic institutions. The gap between the rich and the poor has increased dramatically over the years, with Honduras showing the greatest wealth disparities in all of Latin America. Food insecurity and poverty are acute measures of the extent of inequality, with indigenous and African descendant people suffering the worst impact. Corruption and human rights abuses perpetuate the problems, reducing the quality of life for all people. These intolerable conditions force thousands to flee uh, and sometimes migrate. We are quick to blame people for coming to the border without realizing the extent of what people are forced to leave behind and what drove them to this heart-wrenching decision. We need to explore the nexus between the condition of human rights and human mobility. Migration too is a human right, just as much as people have a right not to be forced to migrate. In Pathologies of Power, hum Health, Human Rights, and the New War on the Poor, Dr. Paul Farmer wrote, Human rights violations are not accidents. They are not random in distribution or effect. Rights violations are rather symptoms of deeper pathologies of power and linked intimately to the social conditions that so often determine who will suffer abuse and who will be shielded from harm. The protection and safeguarding in human rights are key for living faithfully into the UN Declaration on Human Rights, which states how the inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. As people of faith too, our values and sacred texts remind us to uphold the divine in each of us, in each of us and love our neighbor as ourselves. We believe in the dignity of every human being and that everyone has the right to reach their God-given potential. We are uniquely poised and responsible to better understand the complex situations of our neighbors to the South which are too often reduced just to issues at the border, fomenting fear and exclusion. Stories of resistance and resilience carried through on the struggle for rights gives us hope. Today, we all have the distinct honor of hearing from activists leading that charge. I am now pleased to present our first speaker, Claudia Samoyoa. Claudia Virginia Samoyoa is a human rights defender and a lay leader committed to justice in Guatemala. She, excuse me for the helicopter. She is the founder and president of Unidad de Protección de Difusoras y Defensores de Derechos Humanos, Guatemala, and vice president of the executive committee of the World Organization Against Torture. She is uh, widely respected for her work in Central America and has received multiple accolades. She will now speak to us about the human rights situation in Guatemala and ways to promote the work of activists. Thank you. So hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here and hearing a little bit about um, our struggles and now uh, the origin of this huge mobility crisis. So as I was presented, I will speak about Guatemala. I'll speak in English uh, since my presentation is in English. And so I don't have the problem of not remembering which language I'm working on. So the idea is, I, I want to explain to you how a regimen of autocracy and corruption has created this new dictatorship that we are living in through. Um, I'll, I'll try to explain you how this happened, how this came to be. And I have been saying constantly, and I think we we are trying to discuss this within the churches in Guatemala, is how we were not able to uh, rupture, uh, finish a counterinsurgency method of control that is state terrorism. So even though the war ended, 26 years ago, not necessarily the triggers and the elements of counterinsurgency were dissolved. And that has meant that we have a developed from that recognition in the 80s that Guatemala was a victim of state terrorism 
uh, later on we recognized genocide, but we forgot that there was another crime that was committed during the wars. And that this is something that we uh, uh, share with Honduras and El Salvador. And it's basically how this crime is committed. And it's basically committed through the minds of people. And you need fear for that. So if you use fear, then you are able to control the people as society. And first, and because this is the 24th year uh, after the killing of Monsignor Gerardi that happened yesterday, uh, the killing of Monsignor Gerardi was the first sign after the peace accords that there was something very rotten in Denmark uh, uh, or in, in the Netherlands. And this is a, the fear structures were still there. After the killing of Monsignor Gerardi since 2000, we have had what I call a low intensity attacks against human rights defenders. We don't have the huge massacres that, for instance, you can see in Colombia, nor the big displacements of human rights defenders in, in Nicaragua. We have this low intensity where you have more or less 12 or 14 human rights defenders killed yearly. And we have started in 2000 with 57 people attacked. And now uh, last year we ended with 884 and the year prior, 1004 people attacked. So it started against human rights defenders that were seeking for truth and justice. And now it's all over the place, including journalists and a, a prosecutors and judges. Because we were very concerned of the process of what we call the parallel state of the hidden powers, we managed to create the commission, the International Commission Against Impunity, CC. And it has great, it had great growth, especially demonstrating how corruption, kleptocracy, was being built. And it really tried to dismantle this structure of corruption. But CC never touched, really never touched this violent structure, the structures that were promoting fear. So what happened is in 2017, all the groups that were being prosecuted by CC, this include the oligarchy, politicians, and organized crime, organized themselves and develop a strategy. And the, strat the first moment of the strategy was the disobedience of court decision. The ousting of Sisig is what we all saw. But beneath that, we have several actions of the government that were done in this regard of constitutional court or court decisions. That is a level of impunity worse than not having a result when someone is killed. And after doing this, it was very easy for the powers in place to capture the state. And meaning capture is basically there is, um, uh, there is no state institution that I, either has been already been taken, like the kind of the Ministerio Publico or the prosecutor office. And we are just waiting for the capture of the Ombudsman office that will be, ca we will be captured. So we have a kleptocracy is the government of those that steal, those that are corrupt and those that live from corruption. But another way of calling a, a kleptocracy is basically a dictatorship that is easier to understand. It's not Hitler, neither Putin, neither Daniel Ortega, but it's this kind of dictatorships that we had in Guatemala in the past that they just change the names of the people. So right now, all the machinery has been very uh, structured and protected in order to control who gets elected. 
we have one of the biggest um, cases that CC brought forward is the way oligarchy paid and decided who we should vote for. Regardless of that prosecution, Diamate, the actual president, was elected the same way with the money of oligarchs and certain decisions. Right now, that's happening again. So it happened before, but right now it's just very uh, blunt, plain sight. And there's uh, some, some people say, well, let us not waste money in elections. We already know who is going to be elected, how it's going to be elected. And they are willing this time to stop the participation of the indigenous people's political party that has been very successful in its presidential being. We have changed the laws of the land. There's a law against NGOs. They try to push forward a, lay, a law against a gender, ideo what they call gender ideology and LGBTIQ rights that was annulled because of international and national pressures. And right now they want to stop what they call lobbying that is basically the ability of people to go and speak with different government officials, even ask for information will be now prohibited or at least very heavily guarded. And the other one is let us not elect courts. We are already over 900, 900 year, days without an election of the court. And I always remind myself of 10, but now 12 years ago, while Daniel Ortega decided not to elect new courts. Nobody put attention to that, but that is one of the ways you can build dictators, dictatorships. That way you can prosecute and criminalize opposition, but you also can create enough disorder to, uh, for the kleptocrats to win. So doing that, we should ask how to reinstall terror during, the, during COVID. That's what happened the last two years. That's why we have slided uh, from a failed state to a dictatorship so quickly. One of the ways is to kill and criminalize leaders and journalists. The, one of the biggest phenomena during COVID, the first years of the pandemic, was how they moved to criminalize journalists. Journalists at the local level that were investigating the killing of uh, leaders. And when we talk about criminalization of uh, journalists, we are talking about indigenous uh, journalists. Just recently, we have the Mining Secrets Project brought forth all what the mine, the mine in El Estor was doing who were instrumental for that investigation to move forward? Indigenous journalists. Who are being ki killing, killed? Indigenous uh, leaders. Who are being criminalized at the local level? Indigenous leaders. Why? Because where genocide was perpetrated is in indigenous land. Who are suffering from poverty, from the state dismissal, mostly indigenous uh, leaders and basically women and children. And guess what? Our women journalists are the ones that are more criminalized. So that's a way to raise the voice at the local level. Return terror, because you just have to remind terror. And that is the use of prosecuting and pushing independent judges and prosecutors to exile is to create fear. If 24 judges, magistrates, and prosecutors that, ha that, are, that only did their job, they, they were not great human rights champions. They were just basically people that were doing their job for love of justice. What should be very normal in any country became a persecuted and prosecuted. What does that mean? That anyone, a plain Joe, 
is really, really very exposed to this kind of prosecution. If they can be, re they can be tortured in jail, the prosecutors, and if they can be in jail illegally, being lawyers, what should happen to me? That I'm just a community la uh, leader. And furthermore, they use the COVID pandemic uh, process to close spaces for free speech, uh, for association, and for demonstration both through legal uh, means like the NGO law, the passing of new regulation, or just plainly uh, through um, a different uh, legal uh, executive branch provisions. So one of the question is why the dictators bother to create this, um, this fear? if 85% of the population is already in, po in poverty. And when people are living extreme poverty, they, they cannot act very freely. Well, one of the things that the elite, the oligarchs have learned is that if the numbers of poor people, if the number of uh, disgruntled people grow, fear can be overcome. So what you need is to maintain these numbers, both of leaders and of people, low. So if you create the system of fear, then less leaders are raising their voices. Therefore, you have more impunity. Uh, and that's why we have, a, again, and we haven't had this in Guatemala, since uh, the 50s and 60s. And we saw it in Honduras during the first years of the coup d'etat between 2009 and 2011 is exile, political exile. So the voices leave and leaders are, uh, leave the country because they don't want to be in jail. But also you do all of this terror so you have less organizations, less organizing, then you have us oligarchs, more possibilities to extract resources or organize crime to manipulate. And so if there's less organization, a narco trafficker can go into the community and say, well, the government doesn't give you your health, I'll build you a, a health center. The only thing you have to do is X. So that's the ways that the new structure, the criminal structure is organizing for which they need terror. And if there is terror, there is no way a good person, a honorable person will go into government. Why should it? Because if I go into government, either I will be pressured or uh, I will be corrupted. So if there is less government, there's more migration and there's lo less social unrest. Our dictatorships are very happy with people migrating. That's why they don't move a finger to stop migration. For them, migration is important to maintain stability in the country to maintain the control in the country. I, I, I forgot to say other ways of uh, creating this control is basically through the Mareros, what we are seeing in El Salvador. Just imagine, Bukele is um, going against 60,000 alleged Mareros and putting them in jail. That's another way to control social con to control socially a society. And that just can be done if you don't have government. What they're doing in Salvador is just the same. So if there is more impunity, that's the result of terror, then you have more illegal businesses and more tax evasion. That's why even though Guatemala is a very poor country, if you come to Guatemala City or to the big city, you will find these beautiful buildings and people will come and say, why are these people talking about dictatorship, poverty, 
uh, persecution, we have all these beautiful things. All these beautiful things are really illegal, illegal things. So if we have less democracy, there's more mo money and power to the oligarchs. So terror as a way to build dictatorship in Guatemala is really a political strategy of the oligarchy to maintain themselves. The oligarchs will like a, a reform, a constitutional reform, where all human rights be abolished. For them, there's, and I would use the words they use, they use. Indians believe they have rights. They don't even use the word indigenous. It's just Indians don't, uh, don't, shouldn't have rights because when they have rights, they abuse them. That's their understanding. And that's how they see it. So we are living in a dictatorship already. It has been two years of a downward spiral. We won't have a coup d'etat. We even will have elections, but that doesn't mean that we will have democracy. So what's the way? The only Daria, way- If you could inspire us in maybe one minute or so, thank you. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. The way is toward a new pl pluricultural uh, constitutional reform. This is something that has been in the minds and desires of indigenous people in Guatemala. It has been resisted by some indigenous groups and by non-indigenous because we thought that our constitution was a big enough framework for all to come in and we should have just constitutional reforms. Now we are all agreeing. The only way forward is the indigenous way. It's through the pluricultural constitutional reform. And this means something like what Chile is doing. And we are doing it very slowly. The discussions are going on and are being non-indigenous people are willing to participate within the discussion uh, we are waiting and we are hoping for the leadership of indigenous people. So that's a very big shift because it's building the new constitution from the bottom up. What Excuse me, Claudia. I, I wonder if it's possible that we could get to some of the hope and resistance in the question okay. and answer section so we can allow- Okay, so uh, yes, sorry. And so we are moving on to our unity. We are moving uh, these new uh, ways of moving. I just wanted to say and end it up. This is all possible if we can find some counter in, uh, in hegemonity. And this has is very linked with United States policy because two years of, the, uh, of sliding to dictatorships is the, process, the product of Trump and Trump era. So mm -hmm. there is, we are very interlinked if we want to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. We are all one people. And Miriam, um, you're gonna talk to us about Honduras, but first Miriam, is, Miriam Miranda is the general coordinator of the Black Fraternal Organization of Honduras. She's also a human rights defender of the Garifuna community and um, has many ac international accolades for her and recognitions for her human rights work, including the Carlos Escaleras Environmental Prize in 2016 and the Letelier and Mofi Human Rights Award in 2021. I'm now excited to uh, invite Miriam to give her um, perspective in, of the situation in Honduras. Gracias Miriam por sus aportes. Bueno, muchísimas gracias a todas, todes que se han conectado y la gente que les está siguiendo, gracias. Eh, como es tan poquito tiempo verdad, con el que contamos para este foro, yo quisiera concentrarme en un punto eh, que me parece que es importante. Honduras en la última década se convirtió en un laboratorio político perfecto. Yo creo que Claudia ha, digamos, um, puntualizado algunas cosas como resultado de este, de este laboratorio político después del golpe de Estado del 2009. Yo recuerdo que mucha gente, inclusive en Estados Unidos, en algunas universidades hicieron estudios y presentaron eso como una sucesión presidencial, que creo que esa denominación marcó una historia 
de al antes y después de lo que significa que dentro de la institucionalidad un poder le dé un golpe a otro poder, porque yo creo que no solamente fue lo de Honduras, está lo de Paraguay, Brasil, para de contar, ¿verdad? En cuanto a normalizar que un poder le dé un golpe de Estado a otro poder, como fue lo que pasó en Honduras, eh, que generó una destrucción de la institucionalidad, una ingobernabilidad, pero también generó un Estado fallido. Un Estado que en estos últimos 10 años, 12 años, se fue consolidando hasta lo que es eh, una narcodictadura, lo que hasta hace unos días fue el escándalo mundial, que ya no fue ni tan escándalo, porque todo el mundo sabía que teníamos un presidente narco y que fue extraditado recientemente hacia Estados, hacia Honduras, hacia Estados Unidos. Estados Unidos y, y las autoridades y el gobierno de Estados Unidos sabían perfectamente el gobierno que teníamos aquí en Honduras, que creo que es importante mencionar eso, o sea, eh, la, el seguimiento y todo lo que hacen por el combate al narcotráfico, eh, no puede ser que ignoraran que el presidente de Honduras eh, fuese un narcotraficante y que se hubiera instaurado una narcodictadura, que yo creo que son elementos que no podemos olvidar, a mí me da mucho miedo como que la historia... Eh, no nos enseña a hacer esos análisis lo que significa lo que pasó en Honduras y que puede pasar en cualquier otro país del hemisferio y que generó digamos este laboratorio político impulsado por, y bendecido por el gobierno de Estados Unidos eh, un estado de situación en un país tan paupérrimo ¿verdad? con niveles de ingresos y con un nivel de digamos, de inequidad, ¿verdad?, tan grande como lo es Honduras. Y yo creo que es muy claro que esa forma y esta situación de lo que significó esta, la instauración y la consolidación de esta narcodictadura, ¿verdad?, eh, es el hecho de que hay algunas características de, en estos últimos años. Primero, Honduras se convirtió en un país más violento e inseguro sin guerra declarada, entre los años 2010-2012. Hay números que escalofriantes en un país donde no hay guerra, pero que hubiese habido tanta masacre, tanta, uh, uh, digamos, violencia e inseguridad, de tal manera que categorizaba a Honduras como uno de los países más violentos y más inseguros eh, para las defensoras y defensores. De hecho, pues, se mostró que haya sido asesinada una activista y eh, de, de derechos de los pueblos indígenas como fue Berta Cáceres y que contaba con medidas cautelares, una mujer eh, internacionalista y sin aún, aún así la asesinaron y en su propia casa. Yo creo que esa es una cosa muy importante a, a decirlo. Lo otro es que me parece que esta, esta situación gen, generada por la destrucción de la institucionalidad eh, se manifiesta también el hecho de que Honduras se haya convertido en el país, en el primer país en expulsar cientos y miles de personas mediante las caravanas. Un efecto eh, dominó en el sentido de que a la par de que la gente se va, y como tú lo decías, Giovanna, o sea, la gente tiene derecho a migrar, pero yo también reivindico el derecho a quedarme. O sea, no solamente es que vamos a trabajar por los derechos de los migrantes, sino que también tenemos que generar condiciones de vida para que la gente se quede. Y eso es uno de los grandes problemas que ten, enfrentamos como pueblos, sobre todo los pueblos indígenas, los pueblos negros, los pueblos que se llaman afros, es el efecto y, y digamos el gran golpe para nuestros pueblos porque a la par que la gente migra, hay un elemento que no lo mencionamos y es el tema de que nuestros territorios cada día están más en disputa disputa por los narcotraficantes, disputa por las empresas, eh, las industrias eh, extractivistas, o sea, los territorios de los pueblos indígenas nunca en la vida habían estado más en disputa como lo es hoy, y por lo tanto hay una expulsión eh, terrible de los pueblos en la que está prácticamente, y yo lo considero como un genocidio. Yo creo que es importante hablar del genocidio, gobiernos genocidas que se han instaurado bajo, digamos, eh, la, digamos ese, esa supuesta democracia, pero que son al final dictadores, pero también genocidas, que están des a, haciendo desaparecer muchos pueblos. Miriam, um, three minutes. Three minutes. Sí. 
lo otro, el otro punto que me parece que es importante mencionar, el hecho de que producto de esta situación es el que hoy tengamos eh, un país donde se aprobó una ley para eh, entregar por uh, territorios en el marco de lo que son las zonas especiales de desarrollo, las sedes, que a pesar de que hubo una derogación de esta ley en el Congreso Nacional recientemente, hay todavía muchas cosas que se tienen que resolver con esta ley. Yo creo que lo que quiero decir en este minuto que me queda, lástima, ¿verdad? El hecho de que eh, la destrucción de la institucionalidad tenemos que eh, analizarla, pero también estudiar lo que significa la creación de condiciones para que haya ingobernabilidad y sobre todo que no haya respeto ninguno de los derechos humanos, porque no solo es la aprobación de leyes, sino que también como defensoras, defensores de los territorios no tenemos a quien acudir. O sea, es un estado fallido en el cual es sálvese quien pueda. Yo creo que es importante también mencionar que Honduras es el país eh, también uno de los países más vulnerables al cambio climático. Entonces tenemos también expulsados ambientales eh, y yo creo que es un tema también que debemos de hablar sobre el tema de la crisis climática. Muchísimas gracias, Giovanna, y esperamos si hay preguntas. Thank you, Miriam. I hope we get to the part of the question and answer where we can hear about um, your response, your community's response, and how you um, see hope or opportunity um, in, in this new political climate in Honduras. Um, but we really want to leave enough time for all of you in the audience to raise any burning questions you might have in the chat. Give you a minute there to type them out. Maybe while we're waiting for people to, to type in their questions, um, just to really quickly turn to Lisa Haggard, who is with um, the co-director of the Latin American Working Group, where she leads on human rights and peace issues. If you could really quickly respond to what you see as the US's role and you know, how we can encourage um, support activists in, the, in, in like Miriam and Claudia. The U.S. has a lot of responsibility in creating the, the problems that are faced um, in, in Central America. But just in, in, in a nutshell, um, the Biden administration's uh, candidate Biden, um, his initial uh, response was to stop migration. To, we need to address the root causes of migration. And to do so, we need to send $4 billion dollars um, to, to Central America. And we were really concerned with that because sending a multi-billion dollar aid package does not necessarily help. In fact, it can really hurt. It depends who it is for. Is it going to prop up corrupt elites? So we were really worried about this idea of this approach and really pressed the administration to uh, take a really strong stance against corrupt government officials and corrupt private sector elites um, and to stand with the people who are working for change, like Miriam and Claudia. Um, and have they listened? Well, a bit um, in the sense that uh, the Biden administration is putting some sanctions on Guatemala on individuals like visa sanctions um, and is willing to hold up money when needed, for example, to the corrupt attorney general's office. Um, and that's good, but it's still sending a very mis mixed message. It's still sending uh, support for security. Um, uh, security forces. Um, and so the message to Guatemala is it, it's going in the right direction, but it's still far too soft and it needs to be stronger. Um, in Honduras, um, we did see the administration begin to distance itself from the corrupt government of Juan Orlando Hernandez. That was good. Um, and we've seen the administration um, accept and send Vice President Harris to the inauguration of Xiomara Castro. Um, who represents uh, who represents the possibility of some change in, in in Honduras, and that's positive. But we need to see a stronger U.S. policy in terms of um, uh, changing security policy so that aid does not go to corrupt security and abusive security forces. We need a tougher policy towards corrupt actors, including private sector in Guatemala. And we need to make sure that US aid and, and in private sector investment 
uh, does not flow towards corrupt entities or um, projects that are going to displace communities. Um, uh, we need we need the kind of aid and investment that supports um, people that that um, that uh, uh, does not. Um, uh, that does not um, sort of uh, prop up corrupt structures and that respects labor rights and the environment. Um, and all of that, we're not, we're surely not there yet. There's a lot to do. Um, and we need a US policy that really supports the people working for change like Miriam and Claudia. So that's the kind of thing you can ask your member of Congress for. Um, if you sign up to your, for our alerts, you will see opportunities for letters um, and, um, and uh, bills that 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 go in that direction. Um, Thank and, you, Lisa. And okay. we're we're gonna ask um, Yadira to put all of our contact information in the chat so you can be um, collecting that information while we're talking. Um, Miriam, una pregunta para usted desde Linda Eastwood. ¿Qué le parece sería la resistencia de los en poder a la revocación de la ley de sedes? Bueno, yo creo de que es importante mencionar el hecho de que hay un respiro en este momento con el gobierno, con la llegada del gobierno de, de Xiomara Castro, pero eh, honestamente se encuentra ante una situación de un reto mayúsculo, enorme, porque se encuentra un país totalmente destruido, sin fondos, sin recursos y con una dictadura muy empotrada dentro incluso de las instituciones, a tal grado que hoy por hoy ustedes vieron de que Honduras a inicios de enero se instalaron dos congresos nacionales, o sea, no es fácil, ¿verdad?, con, la, con lo que está pasando y nosotros que estamos como no solamente espectadores y espectadoras, sino también eh, tratando un poco de... de y que fuimos parte de ese proceso de, para que no siguiera la narcodictadura, nos, sabemos que no es fácil. ¿Por qué? Porque incluso en este momento hay tres poderes que están separados totalmente, pero hay algunos que están eh, muy controlados por la, esa gente que se fortaleció en, en eh, las instituciones. Y yo no está muy fácil, el Congreso Nacional ha sido una noticia excelente la que recibimos, pero también hay un reto mayúsculo y es que se respeten los acuerdos que se lleguen por parte de, la, de, de este nuevo gobierno. Veremos cómo vamos a, a seguir avanzando. ¿no? Thank you for your brief intervention there. And for both of you now, to close out this session, we're going to ask you a question and hopefully you can leave me a minute to say a, say a final prayer. But what are the main goals of the popular social movements, particularly led by indigenous people and um, black and African descendant people for the necessary, um, to create the necessary justice that you wish to see in Central America? What are the, the main goals you would say? If you could say three goals each. <laughs> so let's start with Claudia. One is to build a new constitution. That's one goal. In order to get that big goal, this pluricultural constitution, we need to build power. And uh, there has been uh, different experiments on how to build a pluricultural, uh, pluricultural indigenous-based political parties and that's what is being done now and there's a big uh, strength for unity and the unity is not only of indigenous people and different uh, democratic forces but also with non-indigenous people and a very pluricultural consensus and the third uh, goal for now is to maintain the idea of the struggle of uh, the right to food to an, an environment, the right of the water. So to maintain this demand mm -hmm. and demonstrating how kleptocracy, how this is a dictatorship. Thank you, Claudia. Miriam, what would be your response? Well, particularmente, nosotros tenemos dos sentencias ganadas contra el Estado de Honduras 
una de las metas que para nosotros es importante para la reivindicación de los derechos de los pueblos indígenas que el Estado eh, hondureño cumple esas sentencias que son, digamos, eh, muy importantes para reconocimiento de los derechos del pueblo garífuna, pero también sobre todo para todos los pueblos indígenas. Yo creo que ahí sería una, una muestra de voluntad política y que eh, estamos exigiendo también que el Ministerio Público, que se pueda nombrar un fiscal especial para de la desaparición forzada, para la investigación de, de la desaparición forzada, a vida cuenta que en Honduras hay garífunas desaparecidos desde el año hace una, más de un año y estamos impulsando ese, ese proceso. Yo ahí lo dejaría, ¿verdad? Y, y agradezco mucho pues la oportunidad que nos dan y que nos brindan a ustedes para poder abrir el debate sobre estos temas que son tan vitales para los pueblos indígenas y para los defensores y defensoras. Gracias, Giovanni. Gracias también. Indeed, we are Vamos. just at the opening and I um offer you this prayer as you now go to the rest of your sessions and to hopefully take action. Lord of wisdom, awaken us to our duty to care for the basic needs of all people. Strengthen with hope, people denied their human rights and freedoms. Provide us all with the voice to cry out for justice for the poor and the oppressed. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining us and have a good evening, uh, afternoon.